الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنة يوم الدين All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day The first of the series of talks today uh, concern the religion of Islam being the right religion, the true religion. This is something, of course, as Muslims, uh, we don't have any doubt about. For the most part, most Muslims do feel that Islam is the right religion. But uh, in a world where people uh, follow many different religions, uh, oftentimes, we as Muslims are put on the spot to defend why we feel that Islam is the right religion, especially in these times when there is a move towards accepting all religions as being okay. You know, the interfaith dialogues and these kind of... of um, gatherings which, uh, where they bring somebody from each of the different religions and you know the study of world religions in the schools now uh, basically promoting the idea really it doesn't really matter what religion you follow you know really as long as you're sincere about your religion I mean that's what's important you're a sincere believer and we shouldn't really be about insisting that our religion is the correct religion I mean this is this is the way it was in the past. But in these times, it's sort of like outmoded or you know, not politically correct to promote the idea that your religion is the right way. It's like you know, extreme. It's looked at as the extreme view. Well, while other religions have modified their approach and uh, moved towards this acceptance of everybody else, Islam hasn't. It has remained firm in its uh, claim to be the right, the true religion of God. Now, the point that one needs to start from is that if we are to follow the true religion of God, then that religion should be one of our choosing. It should be a religion which is of our choosing. It shouldn't be something we inherited. I mean, that shouldn't be why we are following the religion, because my parents follow this religion, and their parents follow the religion, so I am following the religion. If we're doing and we're following Islam on that basis, then we really aren't following Islam. We are following a culture. We're living a culture. Because Islam, as we all know, as we've heard many times, it means submission. Submission to the will of God. And it is not possible for us to inherit submission. You cannot inherit this spiritual act of surrendering to God. You can inherit the customs, but the surrender, you can't. We may look at the children of Muslims as being Muslims just from the fact that the parents are Muslims. However, there comes a time in their lives when they reach the age of maturity where they have to choose. Choose to surrender which will make them truly Muslims in the sight of God. Of course, this, this surrender may not be something which is done openly where a person testifies to faith as one may do as a convert to Islam, where you're required to make an open testimony before witnesses. A person who is 
born into a Muslim family is not required to do that. But they are required spiritually to make that decision. They're required spiritually to make that decision. For their Islam to be real. So, basically, it is Allah's destiny that people are born in different religions. If a person is to follow that religion merely because, as I said, of inheritance, then they cannot be sure that what they are following is in fact the correct religion. And there is a tendency amongst people in the various religions to follow on the basis of custom. You know, they may say, well, yes, I think Islam does have some nice things, you know, I can agree with this, I can agree with that, but I was born a whatever, and I'll die then. You know, that's the general approach. But we as human beings are not the same as animals where a dog is born a, in a dog's family and he's not going to become a cat one of these days. He doesn't have any choice in the matter. You know, he's raised as a dog and he'll always be a dog. And so they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You know, this is what some people when trying to explain Islam to older people, you know, they might respond and say, yeah, it sounds nice, but you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. We say, well, listen, you know, you're not a dog. You're a human being. No matter what programming you have received all your life, you still have the ability to break that programming and to choose what you know to be right. And each and every human being has that responsibility to follow what they know to be right. So if all of the various religions with very few exceptions, claim that their religion is the true religion because even after the interfaith dialogues and everybody patting each other on the back, people still will walk away and saying, but our religion is the correct religion, the best way. If they are all correct, and they all say each one is correct, then we have a problem here. They can't all be correct, and each one says that each one is correct, and the others are wrong. It's not going to work. Either one is correct, and all the others are incorrect, or they're all correct, but they all have to be saying the same thing. They all have to agree, but they don't. So the reality is that only one is correct. And the idea that only one is correct makes sense, not only from the point of view of looking at the religions themselves and what they claim, but looking at human beings in relationship to God having created them in one basic mold that human beings haven't changed over the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years that they have been on this earth. They haven't changed. When you read the uh, writings in, the, in cuneiform of Hammurabi or whatever, Peoples of the past, what they wrote about, what they spoke about, the problems that they were faced with, the same problems we're faced with today. When you read the hieroglyphics of the Egyptians, you find the same thing. You read the ancient texts, you know, writings of, of Jewish tradition, you find the same thing. So human beings have always been human beings. Their needs have not changed. Now, how those needs may be fulfilled may vary with technology and these other factors. 
but the basic needs remain the same. So when God prescribed a religion, and of course we're working from the premise that God did prescribe a religion and that it isn't as some people say that God just created the world and left it to run on its own. And that since they looked around and they saw all the religions are different, that it, they must all be man-made. That was the other conclusion. Right? Right? This is the position of what they're known as the deists. God created the world and left it to run on its own. That position is not logical because it ascribes to God a lack of wisdom. I mean, if one considers God to be the creator, the all-powerful, etc., it's also the all-wise. We don't expect God to function in a way which is obviously considered to be unwise. To have created us and not explain to us what we need to do, that would have been unwise. Just as we in companies, we have set up a company, we hire a bunch of people to come and work in this company, but we don't tell them what they have to do. What are they going to do? Are they just going to come into the company, find their slot somehow, some way, and just get in there and work all day, nine to five, and then leave? No. They'll go to the cafeteria, drink tea and chat, gossip, whatever. That's what they would do. Similarly, when you send children to school, if you don't inform the kids what are they supposed to do at the school, what are they going to do? They're going to just go marching into the classroom, sit down, you know, good kids, listening to the teachers? No. They'll go to the playground. Wouldn't even bother to go inside the school. Go to the playground, they play all day. That's if it's not explained. So we have to explain. We know it's necessary to explain so that things will function the way we want them to function. Similarly, if God created human beings and didn't tell them what they were supposed to do, in other words, give them a religion, then who would find their way? It is basically the same as saying really there is no God. To say that we don't have a religion is ultimately the same as saying really there is no God. We're not really sure. So the deists are really agnostics, those who say, I'm not really sure there might be a God or maybe not. They really belong in that camp. So for the person who believes, yes, God did prescribe a way. It, does it make sense that that way should be different for every people? When people are the same? No. If people, human beings, are the same for the last 100,000, 500,000 years, however long human beings have been on the earth, if they haven't changed, why then should God prescribe one way for one set of people and another way for another set of people? That's not logical. The logical thing is that God would prescribe the way, the way which is appropriate for human beings from the time the first human being is created till the last human being on the face of this earth. That is the logical and reasonable way. So, if that is the case, then the religion should have some or certain characteristics which make it appropriate for human beings throughout these times, locations, etc. So as I said, if we have a religion or if we were to try to choose a religion, the correct religion, then that religion should have certain characteristics which make it suitable, applicable, for uh, people anywhere, anytime. Now, first and foremost, the religion should not 
be based on a tribe based on certain groups of people in certain places wherein the name is related to that particular tribe or that location like Judaism coming from Judea or Hinduism coming from the Indus Valley you know this is it's localized it's not a universal religion a religion which is for all people it's identified with one particular tribe etc etc or nor should it be named after people Christianity if Christianity was the religion which was prescribed by God from the time of Adam we have a problem here Christianity depends on Christ's existence at the end of the line of Jewish prophets it comes into existence at that point Buddhism came into existence with Buddha and Buddha becomes the central object of worship as Jesus became the central object of worship Islam on the other hand means as I said earlier submission it's a principle a principle which is applicable from the time of Adam to the last person on this world on the face of this earth the principle of submitting to the will of God that is the essence of the message and that is the name of the religion now whether you use Hebrew or any other language to express the concept of submission then that is sufficient in the Islamic scheme of things it is not critical that one uses the name Islam itself this is an Arabic term because the final prophet from the Islamic perspective came to initially to people of Arabia speaking Arabic so the expression God's will was being conveyed in Arabic but it was in Arabic with concepts which went beyond the language so the claim of Islam first and foremost is that its name is suitable as a name for the religion of God submission furthermore the central principle the central teaching of Islam is reflected in the name itself the name is not after a person or a place or people it's the principle the central principle the essence of worship the essence of the message of all of the prophets of God furthermore the name of the religion should be found in the scripture of the religion itself now if you go to the scriptures of Christianity for example you will not find Jesus informing his followers that you are Christians you'll find Paul saying or write in the Paul's writings that later on after Jesus time they came to be known in Antioch as Christians they came to be known this is a name people put on them they accepted it or they call themselves that similarly you will not find uh, in the Jewish scriptures the Torah the Psalms where God is saying you your religion is Judaism not find this 
Nor will you find Buddha saying to his followers, your religion is Buddhism. It's not in the scripture itself. This implies humans invented it. Right? In other words, the name of the religion itself, you know, if it's not there in the original scriptures implying that it is something, you know, because the scriptures claim to be from God. So if all the scriptures claim to be from God, then the message, the essential message, the name of the religion should be there identified in the scripture itself. And you can find in the Quran, for example, in the third chapter, verse 85, God is saying there, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ If anyone desires a religion other than Islam, submission to God, it will never be accepted from him or her. There's a clear statement here. Of course, as we said, Islam is in the Arabic term. In the language of Adam, it was whatever it was. In the language of Abraham, it was whatever it was. The concept of submission, you can find that even in the writings of the New Testament and in the Old Testament where the prophets or Jesus speaks about doing the will of God. So that concept is there. It never became the name of the religion because people invented names. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the message, the central message that we spoke about, that being worshipping God alone, because if we submit our wills to God, meaning we do whatever God commands us to do, that is the essence of worship. We worship God alone. That is the essential principle. Now, if we look at the essential teachings found in uh, some of the other religions, I mean, the essential principle in Christianity today, for example, is the idea that Jesus is the Son of God, the third of three, of a trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three gods in one. If we go to the scripture, you will not find that there. It's not found in the scripture. It is well known that these princ this principle was agreed upon by scholars in the fourth century, 325 A.D., or after the time of Christ. 325, after the time of Christ, the name, uh, the principle of Trinity was accepted, was voted upon, decided upon by human beings. And so on and so forth. If you go into what exists of Hinduism today, and you try to find uh, scriptural origin to much of the practice of modern day Hindus, you'll find it's not there. You know, like Hindus, for example, are known to be vegetarians today. Strict Hindus. They're known as vegetarians. But if you go back into the scriptures, in the Gita, you find the early figures, their central figures like Rama and Krishna and all these, they were eating meat. No problem. All the gods who became incarnate, etc., they were all meat eaters. But modern day uh, Hindus became vegetarians. Why? Because they introduced a principle, the principle of reincarnation, which didn't exist before. 
Right? In the early scriptures, you don't find talk about reincarnation. But later on, reincarnation is introduced. Once it's introduced, then you find the need for vegetarianism. Why? Because I know a number of you are probably exposed to the vegetarian campaign. Right? Don't eat meat. You know, animal rights. We should treat the animals as we would like to be treated. You know, this modern trend, Paul McCartney and his wife were known for it, promoting it, and others, you know. Little do most people know that in spite of the arguments that are commonly presented today, you know, that it's not really healthy, you're healthier to eat uh, uh, vegetable matter, and they have a whole you know, um, fancy way of talking about how the cow, when the cow, you know, eats up uh, the vegetable matter and produces its own meat, and then you eat the cow, you're eating the meat, the amount that you gain from the cow is less than the cow gained from the grass, and you know, they have their whole very fancy nice way of trying to argue that it's better, it makes more, you know, biological sense to eat vegetable matter, though when they're confronted with the idea that we do have, you know, the teeth, the uh, canine teeth to chew the meat. Why do we have these teeth? You know, if God, you believe in God, God created us, why did he give us teeth if we were not to chew the meat? You know, it's there for a purpose. Right? Of course, then they get caught up in the evolutionary, you know, where we have evolved, you know, and just the teeth haven't changed over yet, you know. But the point is that if you really get to the root of why and where this idea of vegetarianism comes from, it comes from the concept, this concept of reincarnation. This is the essence of it. They don't talk about it because it's a little embarrassing. Right? The essence of it is that when you die, if you are good, good karma, you come back in your next life a step up the ladder, right? the caste system. You work your way from the shudras, or if you're below that, you know, the outcasts into the caste system. And then as you're good each life, cycle, you come back on a higher and higher level till you reach the level of the Brahmins, right? And when you reach the Brahmin level and you're good, then you experience what they call moksha and you disappear into the world, the, 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 unit, the God, God who, is, who pervades all things, Brahma. This is the uh, basic uh, belief. On one hand, but there's another hand. What if you're bad? What happens now, then you start going down the ladder. Right? If you're at the top, you start working your way down the ladder. If you're bad each reincarnation, you're not a good person, you go down, lower. Then, okay, what happens when you reach the lowest level? You run out of levels on a human level, then what happens? And you come back as an animal. Yeah, you may come back as a goat, or a pig, or a cow, or whatever. So for them, this is where the issue now, if you go and eat a goat, Maybe you're eating your grandfather. You know, he came back, you know, he was not a good guy, and he ended up, there you are now eating grandpa, right? So this is what's really behind the vegetarian campaign. You see? This is what's the essence, but of course it's not presented to us, right? The other side is presented about biology and all. No, that's what's at the bottom of it. So strict vegetarians, the Hindus, that this is what's behind it. They don't want to eat. The possibility of eating your ancestors is very real. Believing in that system. So, when we look at this belief, as I said, it's something which came, was introduced at a particular point in time. And when and, and we look at all of the other uh, ancient religions, you'll find that there is that tendency that the religion that is practiced today is not the religion that was originally practiced. Right? Whereas, Islam from the time of its revelation, it's in the final form, because we believe that the religion of Adam was Islam, the religion of Moses was Islam, the religion of all of the prophets of God was Islam. That form of the religion hasn't changed. What people do today as a Muslim, or supposed to do, Muslims know, you can find out if you don't know, how you pray, how you fast, you make pilgrimage, all of the basic things, your dietary uh, rules, 
dress code, all the different things that people do today as Muslims, practicing Muslims, these were done 1,400 years ago. The religion remains pure from human interpolations, additions, changes, you know, creations. That is, that is the religion as it was revealed, which is available and accessible. Now, of course, as human beings in different parts of the world, you know, people may have strayed from that original message, that pure message, and introduced to their practices a variety of cultural additions. So we may go from, to different parts of the world and find Muslims doing things which are really not a part of the teachings of Islam. But any Muslim anywhere, if he or she wants to find out what really is the teachings of Islam, what really are those teachings, they can do. Because it's not hidden, it's not lost. So though on a cultural level, many Muslims in different parts of the world have strayed away from the pure teachings, they are still available for anyone who seeks it. Now, if we look at Islam and look at all of the other religions in terms of that central message we spoke about, central message being worshipping God alone. And Islam states very clearly in the scripture that all of the prophets were sent with this same message. Now, what we have in the world today as various religions, generally speaking, do not adhere to this message. We find the different religions worshipping different individuals, objects, people, etc. Now, when we compare the religions, we find Islam on one hand calling to the worship of the one true God, the essential message. On the other hand, all of the other religions, we can put them together and say that in general, their message, their central message is the worship of God's creation instead of God. That's what has happened. Of course, all of these religions will express that they are in fact worshipping God. So the, the person who is bowing down to an idol, this person will say, I am worshipping God. The one who worships a human being, whether it is Jesus or whether it is Sai Baba in India, you know Sai Baba, uh, you have eight million, has eight million plus followers, among them the president of India, believing that Sai Baba is God incarnate, they do worship him as God, walk in the face of the earth, all of these people who are worshipping these various objects or creatures they share in the idea that they are worshipping God they all think that they're worshipping God but this in essence we could say is the message of false religion that you are worshipping God but in fact you are not in theory you are but in fact, you are not. So you find, for example, the Hindu who bows to his idol, if he, is, if he is educated, and you ask him, well, why are you worshipping this idol? You're going through all these different changes. You know. they will, he will say to you, well, actually, I'm not worshipping this idol that you see, this physical idol, an object that you see, Actually, I'm worshipping God who becomes concentrated in the object at the time of my worship. Philosophical. But in practice, in reality, what is he doing? He's worshipping the idol. 
But he has found a rationale to explain how it is that he's actually worshipping God when he's actually worshipping the idol. Similarly, for Christians, you know, when we say to them, you're worshipping a human being, Christ. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He was a human being. Well, they say, yes, he was a human being, but at the same time, he was God. He was God who became a human being. And they might even get more philosophical and ask you, don't you believe that God is able to do all things? And of course, as a Muslim, you have to say yes. Allah says in the Quran, how many places? Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah is able to do all things. They say, well, can't he have a son? Can't he become a man? You said he's able to do all things. So, from this rationale, he's able to do all things, then they have said, it's okay. He could be a man. He could have a son. Of course, atheist philosophers threw back at the Christians because of their belief in God becoming a human being and having a son. They said to them, okay, if the God that you believe in is able to do all things, he's all powerful, can he create a stone which is too heavy for him to lift? It's a problem. If he's able to do all things, he's almighty, can he create a stone which is too heavy for him to lift? What's the answer? What do you think? Huh? It's not possible. Okay? He said it's not possible. Well, if you said it's not possible, then God is not able to do all things. Is that true? Huh? That's not true. He is able to do all things. Huh? He's got a problem here, right? This is a problem. Stuck. Well, the answer to this question, or this proposition, is that when we say God is able to do all things, <clears throat> we do not include in the all things the absurdities. Absurdities. Can God become a mosquito and you can? That's an absurdity. You know. Why? Why is it an absurdity? Because we already, when we define God, we said God is one who is eternal, ever living. So if you say God is eternal and ever living, and then somebody says to you, is it possible for God to die? It's an absurdity. You've already said He is eternal, He doesn't die. So if you said he doesn't die, can you then be asked, can he die? No. That's an absurdity. Similarly, if you say God has no beginning, then can you be asked, can God be born? No, it's an absurdity. Because if God has no beginning, he is eternal, then to be born, to be born means there was a time when you didn't exist, and then you came into existence. It's the process of birth. So, this is an absurdity. So, no, we do not include making a stone which is too heavy for God to lift. We don't include that in the things when we say God is able to do all things. You were right in your first answer. Right? Why? Because we believe that God is greater than all things. He is Akbar. We say in our call to prayer, Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than all things. So then if you already said He's greater than all things, can you, to ask, can He make something greater than Himself? This is an absurdity. It's a contradiction. Similarly, to say that God became a man. This is also an absurdity. Why? Because 
man is created. Man is created. So if we say that God, who is the creator, who is himself uncreated, for him to become his creation is a contradiction in terms. If he became his creation, then it would mean that he was in need of a creator. That doesn't work. It means he's no longer God. It means whoever it was who created him, that's God. So it is an absurdity. So it is only in Islam that we find the concept of God clear. There is one unique God. He is the only true God. Everything else besides him is his creation. And that creation should worship him alone. The other point which needs to be noted is that the religion of God should be or should have a scripture which is preserved for it to be evidence for people to believe in the religion the scripture needs to be preserved now whenever prophets came in the past they brought with them scripture and they called people to that scripture they called the people to the scripture but God was sending other prophets after them so it was not necessary to preserve the earlier scriptures however when God chose to send a final prophet the last of the prophets then the scripture which came with him had to be preserved now since no other prophets were coming after him the scripture preserved unchanged the only scripture attributed to God in this world which has remained unchanged from what we call the ancient religions I mean of course we have people popping up in North America every few years somebody will pop up and say well I am God and I have received revelation and yeah he might write something so we're not talking about those kind of religions we're talking about the ancient religions of the world if we look into the scriptures whether they're Christian scriptures or Jewish scriptures or Buddhist scriptures or Hindu scriptures the ancient major religions of the world the scriptures have not been preserved the scholars in these religions all admit that the scriptures have been changed in time or they were written long after the founder and they can't really be sure what he actually said the founders of the religions so it is only in Islam that we have the final message of Islam the, f the scripture sent and preserved as no other scripture before it was remaining until the last day of this world preserved not only in writing because that's one level of preservation but also preserved in the hearts of Muslims over a hundred thousand Muslims over the world living today have the whole Quran memorized from beginning to end and if we go back generation after generation the numbers go into the many millions back to the time of Prophet Muhammad may God's peace and blessings be upon him and upon all of the prophets of God another point which needs to be noted is that the basic religion should be universal it should not depend on 
the prophet who brought it. Because Christians are often asked, well, if you need to be a Christian to be saved, what about the people before Jesus' time? What about them? You know? Then they have to work out some elaborate arguments as to why and how and, well, these people, we're not sure and, you know, nobody really knows. But it is a problem. All of the people, all of the generations that came before Jesus, where people believed, were looked at as servants of God, etc., etc., but they didn't believe in Jesus. Jesus meaning Jesus as a incarnation of God on earth. It wasn't a part of their belief system. So obviously this whole principle was something contrived, brought about at a particular point in time. Whereas when we look at the principle of Islamic teachings, we see that it is applicable from the time of Adam to the last prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be on all the prophets of God. And we find Allah saying in the Quran, Indeed those who believe, meaning the Muslims, those who follow the Jewish scriptures, the Christians and the Sabians, any who believe in Allah in the last day and work righteousness shall have their reward with their Lord. They will not become overcome by fear nor grief. Meaning that anyone who may be referred today as Christians, because people looking back at the followers of Jesus, his disciples, they would say they were Christians. Of course, as I said, it was Paul and those who were with Paul in Antioch who went on to Greece. They're the ones who call themselves Christians. But the real followers of Jesus, they were not known, nor did they call themselves Christians. The real followers of Jesus who remained in Jerusalem, etc., they didn't, they didn't use this name. They were from the perspective of Islam they were in fact Muslims they were following Islam similarly if we go back to the time of Moses and uh, his followers his followers they didn't call themselves Jews this term of Jews and Judaism this came about many centuries after them what they were following the true followers was Islam. And Abraham, who was neither a Jew nor a Christian, as Allah mentions in the Quran, he was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he followed Islam. All of the prophets of God, they submitted their wills to God and they called people to submit their wills to God and to worship God alone. That is the true religion, which is applicable anywhere, anytime. It does not depend on belief in Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some people think, <coughs> mistakenly, that if you don't believe in Muhammad, anybody before the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you can't be a Muslim. But it's not true. It's not true at all. If you believe in Jesus, in the time of Jesus, following his teachings, you were a Muslim. If you believed in David, in the time of David, following his teachings, you were a Muslim. And so on and so forth. For all of the prophets of God. The final point I'd like to mention is a point which deals with a question commonly raised. What about those people who didn't hear the message of Islam? What about them? Is it not God's uh, destiny which determines whether people will be in a situation to hear the message or not hear the message? Is it not God's destiny? So does it make sense? Is it fair that God put some people in a position to hear the message of Islam, believe in it, and then reward them in pa with paradise for having heard the message, believed in it. 
while other people got destined not to hear the message for whatever reason they lived in Alaska message never came to them how many generations as far as we know the message of Islam didn't come to them or maybe in our time since the time of Muhammad Sallallahu there are places in the world where the message of Islam never reached never reached the people so what of these people are they then to go to hell because of the fact that they didn't believe when they didn't even hear the message to believe in it or they may be in a situation where the message has come to them in a distorted form I mean if you ask the average Canadian or American for example what they know of Islam the distorted image of Islam which is presented to them could you expect them to believe in it? could they be blamed for not believing it? in reality? so then what? Islam teaches as Prophet Muhammad explained that for those people who did not receive the message commonly they are referred to as Ahlul Fatra the people who did not receive the message, message did not come to them either not at all because they were in a region where it didn't reach them at all and the earlier messages to prophets that were sent in their region had been so distorted they could no longer recognize it or they lived in regions where they did come in contact with Muslims but the image of Islam or the message which was given to them was false for example those people who are in, in England and North America who when the Qadianis came to England and North America to promote, to promote Qadianism they promoted it as Islam when they came out of India Pakistan and they were the first to be involved in what we may call da'wah calling people to Islam openly the first generation of people who converted to what they thought was Islam they converted to Qadianism Ahmadiyism can we say that the message of Islam reached them? no we cannot say that what, they, what reached them was a distortion so the fact that they might have believed that distortion be thinking that it was correct they cannot be held to blame for that so Prophet Muhammad said that all of those people people who for example were retarded or they were deaf and dumb nobody could get the message to them they couldn't hear it they couldn't speak to express themselves nobody conveyed the message to them or they died as children because the issue of children you know do the, the children of non-Muslims when they die do they go to hell because their parents were non-Muslims no no we cannot say that nor can we say some people ignorantly say they go to paradise it's not, we can't say that either the children of Muslims we cannot say they're going to paradise or they're going to hell we cannot make any statements of that we don't know Prophet Muhammad informed us that prior to the final judgment when the resurrection is taking place all of those people who did not receive the message for any of these factors they will be brought back they will be brought back mature individuals and the message will be brought to them to believe in Allah to follow his instructions and they will be given a test they will be told by the one who comes to them the messenger who God sends to give them this final message they will be told to go into what appears to them to be a fire those of them who go into that fire the Prophet ﷺ said they will find it gardens of paradise they'll be going to paradise those who refuse are those who had they grown up in this life they would have disbelieved and those are the ones who will go to hell so everybody will have a choice as Allah said in the Quran وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ 
hatta nabatha rasula and i would not punish anyone until a messenger has come to them that is complete these are the elements the basic elements which make islam the true religion this is the evidence because people say okay why do you feel the religion is the true religion these are them the name of the religion it's not taken from people, places, things, etc. It's a principle. The central message of the religion. Belief in one God. It's a, but people believe in anyway. But it's pure in Islam. Pure from adultery. It's not adulterated. The religion itself is one which was the same from the time of Adam to the last of the prophets. A single religion. Its principles are universal. They may be applied anywhere because submission is something required of everyone. All of the prophets call to it. Its scriptures remain pure, unchanged. The message is preserved. And... It doesn't depend on a particular individual. Its teachings span time. And finally, its message will be brought to everyone. There is no one who will not receive the message. So there is no gap where people may say, well, the message didn't go to these people, so how can they be expected to believe. Okay, that is the summary of the presentation I wanted to share with you this evening.